So gamma ray bursts were accidental in the 60s because of nuclear bomb detection. Just like Dr. Phillips said, they were trying to make sure no one was setting off nuclear bombs kind of in the upper atmosphere. And we happened to find this thing that looked like it could have been, but it wasn't. And it was actually coming from space. So they were irregular and bright flashes of gamma rays. Very brief, so very hard to actually find and study these. We are getting better. Turns out, and this is why I like this picture with the blue dots, which normally isn't too exciting, but there's not an even distribution. It's not, you know, all in one line or any fancy little form of it. It's just everywhere. And because it's just everywhere, we've concluded that these are actually coming outside of our galaxy, which is pretty cool. So it's hard to measure the actual distance with the gamma ray burst because the burst is so quick, right? It's still hard to get. Um, so we usually look for something near it. Like if we can find it, then we can look for something near it and kind of guesstimate. Um, again, our gamma ray technology is not the greatest. Our textbook says it's really, really bad. It's not as bad as our textbook would have you believe, um, but it is not great. So we still have a little bit low resolution. So remember we talked about resolution, especially I like the picture of Pluto and its moon, right? Because you can see, well, it looks like there's, oh, there's actually two things out there, right? So we have low resolution and just like that last picture of all the blue dots, where in the world are you going to look? And I guess that's kind of the wrong phrase, right? Where in the world? <laughs> where in the universe are you going to look? And then the afterglow of a gamma ray burst dims so quickly that if you find it, I mean, it was by chance. And then to get the telescope there, you have to be quick. So we're getting better, still not perfect. So again, in order to use, measure the distances, we have to use something nearby. So this kind of shows you things that might be nearby the first picture there, but you're looking at the little guy with the arrow, right? And then you can, it's there, and then it's kind of gone. And then, whoa, look at that. That's gamma ray burst. And then you can see it dimming again. Now, we can measure the distances by, again, using some kind of companion something. And so we think that these guys are... 2 billion parsecs away. Just think about that for a minute. 2 billion. And we can detect it. So, um, this picture here shows one that's 5 billion parsecs away. And look at how bright that is that we can detect it. 5 billion parsecs away. Wow. If we were close to this thing at all, we would be fried instantaneously. Let's just make sure they stay billions of parsecs away. That's just, that's incredible. Okay, so like I said, let's make sure that we stay billions of parsecs away because the energy from one of these guys. Now, if you were to assume, which when we first started studying these, maybe that, that's kind of what we thought, the energy is giving off all around, just like our sun, right? It's giving off all around equal directions. There would be 100 more, 100 times more energy than a supernova. Thankfully, it's only given off in one direction. So we think it's actually given off in a jet. So our calculations are often is actually not that strong. However, if you were in that jet, you would still be fried. I love the name of the model of a GRB, a gamma ray burst. It's a relativistic fireball. Yeah, so basically we have fireballs, like as if the sun and the stars are not fireballs, right? They're just things out there that are cool and not giving off that much energy. And then you have fireballs. You just think about that comparison. Oh my goodness, you don't want to be near a GRB. So, super hot gases shoot out in jets, kind of like pulsars. 
and giving off gamma, gamma ray radiation. Um, now, <laughs> so millisecond pulsars moving at 20% of the speed of light, right? We talked about that. These things, the gases are moving close to the speed of light. Hmm. The gases, not the light, the gases. So this thing heats up and bursts out gases so fast that they're being pushed out at almost the speed of light. Now, so there's two methods that this way these things can form. Merging stars or hypernovas. So model one, there's two star systems. There's two stars, right? Binary stars. Both of which are neutron stars. And they're orbiting each other, do 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 do. And the gravity is pulling them closer and closer and closer because they're both huge binary stars. So their gravity is just attracting each other. So every time they orbit, they're getting closer and closer and closer. And then finally, you've got a neutron star. Remember, that's like packed as dense as you can possibly get the universe next to a neutron star, and they butt heads. So they literally just, they butt heads and merge together. And all that energy that happens is actually releasing gamma rays and gravity waves, both of them at the same time. And so you get this gamma ray burst. All right, now think about that blue dot chart where there's just gamma rays all over the place. That could mean that those that there's two neutron stars collide all over the place quite frequently. All right, but there's another method that these things could form. Hypernova. So, not quite a supernova, but basically you've got, and again, some of this is chapter 12, but you've got a star, a huge star, not like our star, like a big, big, big star, and it starts to collapse on itself. And it makes a black hole rather than a supernova. So it's a hypernova, it's a failed supernova. Star collapses into a black hole, forms the accretionary disk, and as it's as all of this is happening, okay, I know I'm going through it step by step, but it's all happening kind of instantaneously. Uh, the accretion disk is happening, you're getting heating up and jets flying off and they could be hot enough to be gamma ray burst jets. And so everything's starting again. So again, picture is the collapsing star, supernova, black hole, accretionary disk, and then you get this fireball. All right, so which model is it, right? As with the moon, there was different models that we think might have happened. Which model is it? Well, with the gamma ray burst, we're going to go with both. Okay, because there's actually two types of gamma ray bursts. One has a longer gamma ray burst, and one is a shorter gamma, gamma ray burst. So the longer one, we think, are like the black hole ones. Okay, that kind of black hole, accretionary disk, jets flying out. And by longer, I mean two whole seconds. Yeah, super long, right? And then... The shorter one is the neutron star merger. So again, the two neutron stars, button heads coming together, um, that's a shorter burst than two seconds. So because there's two distinct types, we think that maybe both models are correct. About 1,200 years ago, Earth may have experienced one of the rarest and most powerful cosmic events a planet can be exposed to a gamma ray burst. We're not sure yet if it actually happened, but if it did, well, let's just say that we as living things on Earth are lucky it wasn't worse. Gamma rays are the most energetic form of light, and when explosions in space release them in sudden bursts, lasting anywhere from a few milliseconds to a minute or more, they release radiation that's a million, 
trillion times as intense as the sun. Astronomers think these enormous blasts of energy come from a couple of different sources. Some bursts last on average for about 30 seconds and occur when massive stars die in a violent supernova, creating a black hole in the process. But as gamma bursts go, 30 seconds can be a long time. Short bursts, like the one astronomers think might have hit the Earth, last for just a second or two and almost always occur when two neutron stars or in some cases, a neutron star and a black hole collide. Neutron stars are almost inconceivably dense. Picture the entire mass of the sun crammed into just a couple of kilometers. If a couple of these extremely dense stars collide, the result is so powerful that it releases some of its energy as gamma rays, which have the smallest wavelengths and the most energy of any wave in the electromagnetic spectrum. These gamma ray bursts, or GRBs, aren't exactly rare on a universe-wide scale. Because they're so bright, they're easy to spot with telescopes, even at the outer reach of the universe. But within our galaxy, astronomers believe they only happen about once every million years. And GRBs only release a very narrow beam of powerful radiation, which means a planet has to be in just the right place at the right time to be struck by one. So what makes scientists think a GRB hit Earth? The answer lies in ancient trees and ancient ice, where in 2012 scientists discovered unusually high levels of two particular isotopes carbon-14 and beryllium-10. These isotopes form when radiation from space collides with nitrogen atoms in the atmosphere, causing them to decay. Because cosmic rays are constantly bombarding our atmosphere, we expect to find certain amounts of these two isotopes lying around. But they turned up at levels 10 times higher than normal in two distinct places, in the tree rings of old Japanese cedars and in ancient layers of Antarctic ice. Both of these sources have been dated to about the same time, around the year 775. Based on what they're seeing, scientists estimate that the energy that caused these anomalies was roughly equivalent to 13 Hiroshima bombs spread out over half the planet's surface. Unlike the famous supernova of 1054, which was recorded by cultures all over the world, there doesn't appear to be any historical record of people noticing anything unusual in the sky around 775. But that doesn't actually tell us much because the burst probably only lasted two seconds and may not have emitted any visible light. But of course, there are a couple other explanations. A historically large solar flare could have bombarded Earth with enough radiation to create the clues we're seeing. But it also would have caused a truly spectacularly large display of northern lights. Which again, doesn't seem to have been noted by anyone. A nearby supernova is another possibility, but for such an event to send out comparable levels of radiation, the explosion would have been easily visible from Earth. And again, there's no record of such a thing happening. So we're left with the GRB scenario. Scientists believe the explosion that caused it must have occurred between 3,000 and 12,000 light years from Earth. Because if it were any closer, the radiation would have caused the sudden extinction of at least some life. Though highly unlikely, what would happen if a comparable GRB struck Earth today? Well, it depends how far its source was from us. If it was more than a few thousand light years away, Earth's atmosphere would absorb most of the dangerous radiation, so humanity would be okay. But our satellites and power grids would all be fried, likely causing some post-technological scenario worthy of a cable TV drama that you wouldn't be able to watch? If the burst occurred closer than 3,000 light years away, the radiation could destroy a fair amount of our atmosphere, particularly the ozone layer, which is made up of triple oxygen molecules and protects our planet from the ultraviolet radiation from the sun. With our shields basically down, Earth's surface could be exposed to potentially lethal levels of radiation, which, while not killing everything, would certainly add to the list of mass extinction events that our planet has endured so far. So on the bright side, if a gamma ray burst did happen to graze Earth 1,200 years ago, at least we don't have to worry about it for another 999,000 years or so. Thanks for joining me for this episode of SciShow Space. If you'd like to learn how you can help us keep exploring the universe together, go to subbable.com slash scishow. And don't forget to go to youtube.com slash scishowspace and subscribe.